Welcome to the Toll and Stone podcast. I'm Garrett Ryan, and my guest today is Gareth Harney. To fans of Roman history, Gareth is best known as the man behind Optimo Principi, the biggest, and in my opinion, best Twitter account on Roman history. Um, so, Gareth, welcome to the program. It's great to be here talking to you today, Garrett. Oh, likewise. And so today I want to talk about the agony and ecstasy of bringing Roman history to a large online audience, which we both know something about uh, at this point. Um, and in a more general sense, we at least broach the topic of why the Romans are so enduringly fascinating and why in some sense they still matter so much in our day and age. But first, um, I have a, a burning question, and that is, what is it like to argue with Russell Crowe on Twitter? <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit intimidating. It's a bit scary, but um, it's just a good uh, example of some of the fun things that can happen on Twitter. You know, you never know who's who's one click away, and it kind of exemplifies the possibilities of the medium, really. And um, I wouldn't say uh, Russell's on first name terms or a, a fan at any, by any means, but we had an interesting exchange just very quickly. I'd um, I'd uh, been to an exhibition where gladiator props were on display. And they had his cuirass armor from the opening battle of Gladiator, uh, which obviously I'm a huge fan of. And I'm sure lots of uh, other fans of the ancient world love the movie as well. And um, I shared a photograph of, wow, Maximus's armor. Here it is. And uh, really quickly, actually, he replied, uh, Russell himself, and said, hey, that's not my armor, mate. You know, this is my armor. And he had his uh, his armor there. I think it was on display <laughs> in his bedroom. But um Hey, if I was Maximus, I, I'd keep my armor and display in my bedroom as well, I think. <laughs> and uh, so what followed was a little bit of a, an exchange where we put our heads together and tried to figure out what armor this actually was in this uh, this exhibition in London. And uh, I think the, the auction house were... were uh, they got involved and I think they were sweating a bit as well because he was questioning the, the provenance. But... Um, in the end, we realized that this was a stunt armor that he was using on his uh, horse scenes at the start of Gladiator, uh, where they have to uh, have some softer armor in case an actor falls. And we got to the bottom of it, and it actually finished with him saying, sorry, mate. Yeah, it is my armor. There you go. And um, yeah, there we are. But he's, he's actually responded to a couple of my posts since. I did a fun thing on Gladiator, again, as, yeah, just exploring the possibilities of Twitter a couple of years back where uh, Gladiator turned 20. So I devoted a day to, you know, short, uh, sharing all sorts of, uh, you know, behind the scenes photos and uh, interesting anecdotes from Gladiator. And uh, he kind of shared a few of the things from that as well. So that was oh, good fun. fun. Oh, yeah, that's, that's excellent. Um, and I think what's, what's most impressed me about your, your account in many ways is the sheer variety of things you've managed to feature, whether it's, you know, the stuff from Gladiator, whether it's recently discovered artifacts, historic sites, you name it. And so I wanted to ask you, know, how do you select the things that you feature on Twitter? Is it just serendipity or is there kind of a grand plan here? Or? Well, you know, with my account, I just aim to make it as, like you said, as varied as possible and just try and give anyone who decides to follow me and decides to you know take a chance with my account just to give them as complete an immersion in the the, the material history of the of the Roman world mm -hmm. really you know that idea of sharing just the endless wonders of the Roman world that's that's kind of what I'm passionate about that's how I feel about the Roman world and its its artistic and material heritage and uh, so you know I'd, I'd like to say there was some grand plan to what I share but <laughs> there really isn't um, you know whether it's a dazzling artifacts you know the colorful glass and gems and the gold absolutely but also poignant tombstones and mm -hmm. bits of someone's personal you know jewelry whatever it might be things that really show the the human side of this of this ancient world that we're all celebrating mm -hmm. um and then yeah sources as well bring into life ancient sources in exciting ways you know i love just trawling through sources and reading different accounts and you know whoever it might be and Pliny is always great and oh, yeah. uh, you know you get some great stuff from well Pliny the Younger and Pliny the Elder actually Pliny the Elder quite entertaining but bring it to life you know whether it's things that connect to our our modern life the medical history politics mm -hmm. um, anything at all so I like to illustrate things in an exciting way and you know some of the great things you've done on your tube as well uh, on, on your youtube count as well you know we've um we, we both enjoy sharing those those ancient sources and bringing them to life for, for a wider audience that might not ever 
think to go to the source and uh, mm -hmm. you know i like to try and remind people that you can and there's just fantastic um, accessible translations of all these wonderful things you know whether it's caesar's campaigns or marcus aurelius's mm -hmm. meditations which you know I, I personally like to share quite quite often and, and mm -hmm. uh yeah so just give people something that's a little bit more of a an accessible uh yeah kind of access point into the into that ancient world because i think sometimes the romans can be mythologized and they can be cold statues mm -hmm. uh, that seem distant and remote and i think the goal of my account is to just remind people that there is this incredible human heritage mm -hmm. uh, of the ancient world that is the thing that you know for every caligula there's uh there's there's a Trajan, there's a there's a Marcus Aurelius, you know, there's good and bad, mm -hmm. there's uh, you know, it's not so much melodramatic heroes and villains, you know, there's there's emperors and oh, millions of people just living their lives. And mm -hmm. uh, I think the one thing that I, I've learned being on Twitter and the amazing people that I connect with on there and who share things that are much more interesting than my than my account is this idea that the further we get from the ancient world, the further we get from the Roman world, particularly because mm -hmm. of the incredible heritage they've left us the more we understand of it. And I think that's pretty unique in history. Um, you know, there's such an incredible world still to be discovered, you know, mm -hmm. and literally under our feet uh, in, in many countries. And uh, another thing on my account is just trying to keep up to date with some of these discoveries, because every week it seems like there's new hordes, there's new incredible mm -hmm. discoveries from Pompeii. And uh, it's just really exciting. And, uh, you know, it's one of the benefits of Twitter, you know, it's immediate, you can right. share things very quickly. And, you know, just last week, there was, uh, uh, it was incredibly tense. There was a, uh, a, a wardrobe being excavated in Pompeii in, in one of the huh. new sectors that they are uncovering in Pompeii. And, it was almost kind of this live excavation as they went down in this wardrobe and found what was in it. And there's this undisturbed glass work and oh, wow. um, all sorts of things. They haven't got to the bottom of it yet, but you know, I'm checking in on this excavation of uh, a, mm -hmm. a wardrobe in Pompeii, you know, a thousand miles away. And um, I think that just illustrates the yeah incredible world we mm -hmm. live in. It's, um, it's pretty fun, but I think with Twitter, you know, it is what you make it. Um, mm -hmm. And I got into it because it was where a lot of incredible people were gathering, um, which I don't rank myself amongst them. But I wanted to <laughs> learn from, you know, archaeologists. You could you could ring fence this place that was about your passion. And mm -hmm. for me, you know, since my teens, it was Roman history, ancient history. I just wanted to totally throw myself into that world, and uh, that's where a lot of these people were. And you know, it's offered me the most incredible learn learning experience, and uh, mm -hmm. again, put me in touch with some amazing people who can answer my questions. And you know, there's so many things that I've they've helped me get to the bottom of, and uh, you know, research and uh, just engaging with with things that I photographed, and and yeah, just constant learning and. It's kind of like a journal for me as well, but yeah, it, it started to grow in 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 its following. And just in the last few years, you know, I think I've really tried, I've really managed to reach reach a following that I'm quite proud of of mm -hmm. of other people who, yeah, are just excited by the ancient world like I am and just want to throw themselves into that. And uh, I kind of people know what they're going to get from my account. You know, I don't offer them one thing and then give them another or. Mm -hmm. start throwing myself into all other nonsense debates that go on on Twitter. You know, I think it's still just about possible to kind of put a fence around your interest and, and just celebrate one thing on there uh, for mm -hmm. your followers. So that's what I try to do. Well, that, that's inspiring, to be honest, thinking of, you know, that there, there is this realist sense that Twitter and the internet in general can be what it was meant to be, you know, 20, 30 mm -hmm. years ago, you know, a place for communities to come together, share in this like mutually fulfilling and, you know, intriguing way. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's great to see when it actually works. And, and the idea that Roman history is not a closed book, I, li I like that very much, mm. that, you know, that there's history being constantly uncovered. And even if it's been uncovered already, being brought to light on your account, for example, to people who often, like, like myself, I find something on your account, like, oh, I never knew that ring, or I never knew that, you know, artifact mm. existed, that's so cool. Um, Likewise. And, yeah. and, and, and so, yeah, it's, it's certainly the sense that the sense of discovery um, is a wonderful thing. And obviously, there's a lot to choose from. You've been doing this for for quite a while now. So, maybe, what uh, ten years, maybe? Is that is that correct on Twitter? Yeah, I joined way back in uh, 2010. Um, oh, well, more I than had 10 to years, look. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah uh, so 12 years ago now. So pretty crazy. And like I said, you know, 
I probably just uh, read and followed interesting people for the first couple of years, but gradually mm -hmm. just shared, you know, I, 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 when I kind of find a passion, I kind of throw myself into it hundred percent. So, you know, pretty much all I did was travel ancient sites in, in the holidays from my, my teaching job that I had and uh, mm -hmm. photograph, you know, wonderful things in galleries and just kind of immerse myself in stories from the ancient world. So as I started to share more and more of those, again, I, I very, very gradually found an audience, but sometimes people send me a message like, how do you, how did you get the followers that you've got? And I've certainly mm -hmm. not got, you know, a kind of a, a amount of followers comparable with some other people, but um, it, there is, it, it was just time and effort you know i just did one thing for many many years <laughs> and eventually the the people that were interested you know they're going to find you so uh there was mm -hmm. yeah there's no magic magic secret really oh that, that's inspiring for those of us on youtube believe me <laughs> uh, but um so in all those years of posting i mean is there any thread or threads that stand out as your favorites either they were you know the best realized most intriguing um you know for whatever criterion yeah, so a few years back, um, Twitter introduced this idea of crafting threads and making a more in-depth kind of maybe you know storytelling experience. And I, mm -hmm. I'm always interested in seeing what the possibilities of, of a medium are, and uh, I've enjoyed just kind of testing that and seeing what you can do with it, and seeing if you can add just an extra sense again of. of immersion and uh, access to the ancient world. I've probably done hundreds of threads by this point, and, and it's terrible, really, because one of the drawbacks of Twitter is it's really not, it doesn't really exist as a an accessible body of work, you know, like a, mm. like a great blog or, a, you know, a book. So um, a lot of people find my account and don't realize that I've been going for many, many years, just kind of throwing out all these stories from the ancient world. And sometimes, you know, I dig back and find some of the old ones that I wrote and, uh, you know, I forget some of the things that I've written about actually on Twitter and <laughs> it's, but, and, and that's fine. You know, some of these things just get lost in the ether and that's absolutely fine. It's uh, again, it's kind of selfish, really. I just love, uh, <laughs> you know, this idea of the journal that I, I've just been and seen something incredible, like, wow, I've got to share this. And mm -hmm. uh, I enjoy doing it at the time, but sometimes the things you think are really going to connect, you think, wow, this is such a great story. Often invariably they just get, you know, kind of, lost in the wilderness and, and not many people are interested. And then some of the things you don't think about much at all uh, really seem to find an audience for some reason. Uh, there's been a few that I've done over the years that I really enjoy. Uh, if any of you listeners want to go to my account, they'll see a, a thread pinned on my account, which uh, is just one of those great examples where the ancient world uh, just kind of breaks through into the modern world in, in some of the most surprising ways that it will often do. And they're the stories I like and often kind of linking up ancient stories with modern touch uh, cultural touchstones that people uh would you know would not expect i'm trying not to give any spoilers here but if anyone wants to go they'll see a uh, a thread about a roman ring that was found at the town of silchester um and a roman curse on a lead tablet that was also found nearby and some of the research i did uh, after seeing these artifacts just connected together this story of how these artifacts were put in front of a very famous uh, Oxford Don of the time who was about to embark on a very famous series of books. I won't say any more than that, but if anyone wants to see how <laughs> these Roman artifacts might connect with um, a very famous writer who's in the news a lot at the moment, actually, um, then please visit my account. Um, I've done a lot, you know, there's, there's, there's one... I really like because it was again just me testing the limits of of the form really and seeing what I could do, and it was on uh, March the fifteenth, two years ago I believe, uh, which is the Ides of March, and it was just a crazy idea I had to do um, live Ides, Ides of March live, <laughs> and to in the present tense bring to life uh, Caesar's assassination in a twenty four hour period and. Uh, it was just great fun. And, <laughs> you know, I was tweeting every every few seconds, really. And I had, you know, a, yeah, it was a, a bit, um, you know, challenging at times trying to keep up with the events, but I'd had all the events mapped out. You know, it was such uh, fun to prepare. And, uh, you know, by the end of the day, because I had this hashtag live Ides, by the end of the day, you know, I'd amassed quite a following. And some people, you know, actually said they found it quite uh, moving when spoiler alert, hmm. you know, about halfway through the day, uh, Caesar's lying on the Senate floor, and uh, you know, Brutus does his uh, his last stab in the ribs, and 
you know, people were like really enthralled. And but the the lead up to it, of course, and you know, it was fun, but it kind of reminds you, oh, this this was actually a real event that we have lots of kind of eyewitness testimony about and mm -hmm. testimony from later on that involved real people. And you kind of think, oh yeah, that that oh wow, M Mark Anthony must have been in a really difficult position there. Or oh wow, yeah, the, the troops are just outside the city. You know, that that puts some people in in some difficult positions. Or uh, um, you know, Decimus Brutus with his gladiator troop who were just stationed outside as you know kind of heavies. There's all, all these factions, and you know, I was trying to go around them all and just it would be a great idea for something else in a different medium. This like 24 hour. The idea mm -hmm. was that it was probably the the 24 hours in the ancient world that we know the most about. So mm -hmm. many people felt the need to comment on it. So many uh, accounts survive from different points of view as well. So, you know, a lot of what I had to do was way up, um, you know, well, where's Calpurnia at that point in the, in the morning? And, uh, oh, you know, roughly what time would it have been that Caesar eventually arrived at the Senate? And, you know, how, how you know, wh where was the soothsayer when he, mm -hmm. you know, said the Ides of March are come and, and yeah. You know, well, Caesar, you know, said they're not, uh, the soothsayer said they're, they're come, but they're not gone. You know, so it was uh, just great. And, you know, bringing in Shakespeare, you're bringing in everything. So that was mm -hmm. that was great fun. And at the end of the day, some people said they, they'd been following it all day long. So that was good. I might resurrect that um, on a on a coming March the 15th. So mm -hmm. watch this space. We'll see. But I'm looking out for other, um, if any of your listeners have any other ideas for days where you could do the day live and I'm willing to get up at the crack of dawn and, and do it live for people on Twitter if there's a day that they uh, they think would really work. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about maybe uh, Elysia live, you know, Caesar uh, ah. build it, building his double wall, but I don't know if we know mm -hmm. much uh, enough about the time frame. But um, yeah, something something fun like that. You know, I love just having fun on there. And mm -hmm. if people follow, great. If not, yeah, I'm having a good time. So. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's kind of a perfect world, right? And actually, I think Elysia would be great, you know. All oh, the gulls are yeah. massing outside, you know. The the, the, you know, the wallum. <laughs> oh, great stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. Or yeah. Um, you know, Varus in the German forests oh, as well. Yeah, right, that could right. be pretty. That could be pretty tense. Yeah, yeah. it's still raining, you know. Figures moving in, the, <laughs> moving among the trees, yeah. you know. The mist thickens. Oh yeah, um, exactly. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that you said that people res responded to the the immediacy um, of that thread. You know that they were they they realized it was a thing that happened. You know, and they were caught up in the moment and the whirl of action. And uh, mm. in your experience, um, is this the sort of thing that draws people to threads on Twitter? You know, what do people respond to most um, when you post about Roman history? What is it that catches their attention and interest above, above all? Do you have one one salient characteristic? Yeah, you know, I think people love surprise, people love twists, you know, all those things. And mm -hmm. Roman history just gives that in reams. And there's such a, you know, a, just a, a kind of tragic drive to some of the character flaws and the pride that a lot of these people are guilty of, you know, in the ancient world, but particularly in the Roman world. Mm -hmm. um, I think ultimately people are drawn to stories that humanize an ancient world that they've always felt uh, or maybe in their adult life have become quite distanced from. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people, one of the biggest comments I get from people online is, you know, wow, I forgot these were real people, even though it sounds like a silly truism. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, you know, these were real people with real hopes and fears and and dreams and loss and grief and felt emotions like we do. And, you know, a tombstone, for instance, um, I love Roman funerary art because, the raw emotion sometimes that comes through from the mm -hmm. the verse, you know, the poetry that people put on their tombstones, the loss of a child, or even if people want to check my account, you know, the loss of a pet, you know, there are incredible tombstones that it's just like people's posts on Facebook today, you know, when they've lost uh, a beloved pet, you know, it, things that show this was a human world inhabited by a very wide cast of characters and people who had daily preoccupations beyond, you know, what's the latest thing Nero, Nero was up to. Mm -hmm. uh, I think people respond to that idea of just being able to identify mm -hmm. with a world that often in school they've become very excited by and very interested in. And some people have even learned a bit of Latin in school. And, you know, a lot of people say, wow, this takes me right, right back to my school days. I wish maybe things had been taught a little bit more like this, you know, bringing mm -hmm. the ancient world to life. So I think people like that idea of a world brought to life and showing that, you know, you've got millions of people living their lives and just artifacts with 
a kind of human slant. So, you know, whether mm-hmm. it's a gaming board with gaming pieces, you know, and oh, okay, they were kind of into gaming, I suppose. You know, you can make mm-hmm. that connection right, right. to our modern lives or uh, fragments of letters, you know, our, our Vindolanda tablets in the north of England, which mm-hmm. are still being brought to light. You know, there's like, hey, do you, I got to, are you going to come to my birthday party? And there's soldiers requesting more underwear and you know hey my 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 cohort are out of beer you know can i get a beer <laughs> delivery because you know my soldiers are, are kind of acting out acting out uh, you know so these are human beings you know mm-hmm. they they they're dealing with largely a lot of the same issues that we do mm-hmm. and uh, obviously in a very different world with a very different framework and very different morality but um graffiti you know someone's Someone's sitting on the throne, and I don't mean the emperor's throne. And you know, they're going to write some graffiti on the wall mm-hmm. about uh, how proud they are of what they've just achieved. You know, there's these examples in right. Pompeii, and um, and then other things. You know, where you really uh, literally see a human face is quite surreal. So, if any of your followers know the um, the incredible funerary art of the Fayum in mm-hmm. Egypt, uh, where I think probably thousands of funerary portraits survive of the of the deceased, um, young and old, but a lot of them very, very young. And I think a lot of the research suggests that they're probably painted from life and uh, painted at the age of uh, the, the time the person died. And, you know, these are just real, it's just, uh, act, you know, jaw-dropping art from the ancient world, uh, comparable to you know, you've got techniques of of the Renaissance artists in there, you know, predated by a thousand years. Mm-hmm. Um, even the impasto techniques of you know Van Gogh and, it, but some of them, you know, you really just you feel like you are looking at your next door neighbor. You know, a lot of people comment, you know, I, mm-hmm. I met that guy at the coffee shop the other week. You know, people really feel like they can see the person see the human being and what you know maybe what some of their um what some of their hopes and dreams and what the, some of the things going on in their life might have been uh, mm-hmm. you really again give that that world which seems so distant um a human face yeah well that, that and that's a very valuable and a very striking way to approach it you know it's funny you mentioned this idea of people recognizing you know neighbors and friends in ancient art i was at a coin show a couple weeks ago and mm-hmm. uh, there was a, a guy showing me this uh, wonderful bactrian silver piece uh, with one of the later kings and sort of the, this um this jowly rather self-satisfied looking guy um uh, on the on the obverse and he's like this coin got me into ancient history because I, I saw this coin like this is my art teacher you know mr so-and-so and he, he was so struck with that that idea that you know here's this you know guy who was living in breathing off in Central Asia, you know, 22 yeah. centuries ago, and it was a king somehow or other, you know, had this this interesting living connection with his art teacher. Um, and they did that, <laughs> that, that Roman history is, is more than just these grand marble monuments, you know, and, and unpainted statues, you know, that it is this vibrant breathing place where millions of people live, die, interact, you know, yes. hope and dream. Um, yeah, I think that, that that's the essence of why history is so fascinating, really. And I, you know, I, I try... You know, for better or worse, do this on my own channel um, to try and capture the Absolutely. again the vibrancy, the immediacy of people. You know, living in a world that, though different physically from ours, you know, has the mm. same emotional palette in all, all sorts of ways. Um, Absolutely, and yeah. you do it fantastically. And I think you know, oh, you. there's mm. a tendency for people to approach empires as this great monolith, and you know, the, the Greeks mm-hmm. were this, the Romans were this, and right. you know, I just like to take people as they come and just remember that everyone Mm -hmm. through history has been a human being. Uh, You know, I tend to see history in the tragic mode and, you know, none Mm -hmm. of these people got out alive that I write about. And, you know, a lot of them lived very difficult, short lives with very different priorities to the ones we have today. And I try and stay away from what I think is, you know, a little bit of the arrogance of modern thought really in, in, transplanting all our modern concerns and all our modern Mm -hmm. um, moral kind of, you know, paranoias onto people in the ancient world who lived drastically different lives Mm -hmm. and which were often brutish and short. And, you know, they really lived life life at the extremes, you know, and I think that's fair to say. And uh, I try to give people who lived in the ancient world the respect of just looking at the sources and trying to do Mm -hmm. a bit of research and thinking, you know, what, what, what was it like for these people, you know, day to day? And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that, that learning journey never, ne- never ends. But uh, yeah, just like yeah. you, I, I really enjoy it. Yeah, either the past really is a foreign country and that, you know, we shouldn't assume that these people, you know, who do seem so similar in interesting ways, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. truly are 
you know, just like us, but happen to be wearing togas and speaking Latin. Um, and, and actually, on that note, I was curious, you know, obviously you see on Twitter, you know, certain pools of interest and probably quite a few misapprehensions about the ancient world, you know, just these glaring mistakes that people either assume something or just wildly mistaken off base. Um, and so I, I guess if you, you know, as a public historian, you know, could correct one misapprehension about the Greeks or Romans, um, what would that be? Public historian is very daunting. Please don't put that <laughs> that weight of expectation well, you know, on me. I suppose um, I no, you're right. You know, when, if you prefer, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you do when you build up a bit of a following. You do come up against a lot of the same types of misconceptions and ideas. You know, because I think mm-hmm. everyone feels like, or well, people who kind of have any type of interest feel they've got a stake in the ancient ancient world and feel like they know it in some way Mm -hmm. and the ancient world of course is so represented rightly so in films and television in the media and and i i adore those representations as much as anyone but they kind of they they kind of create this cycle of feeding on each other and some of those misconceptions get recycled so much that they become uh a part of you know the the orthodoxy really Mm -hmm. and uh yeah, I think that, you know, the, there's some huge ones that, you know, I'm certainly not the authority to put them right, but you can, you would come across a lot of things, you know, all the time. Um, you know, just this idea that, like we've already discussed, really, that the Romans must have been this, this kind of uh, stiff upper lip, you know, unfeeling, mm-hmm. stone faced, just like their statues, you know, people incapable of emotion and, you uh, You know, you come up against a lot of misconceptions of people thinking, oh, you know, they didn't even care when their children died. You know, Mm -hmm. it was just they, you know, uh, it was all stoicism. And, uh, you know, the Romans didn't really show any type of grief or emotion. I mean, it's just when you look at the sources, it's just not true at all. You know, in fact, if anything, the Romans seem to emote even more than we do in in, in incredible uh, when they were capable, you know, in incredible language that's left to us as well. And, and the sources really show that. Um, another one, I, a big one I often, you know, we haven't got the time to put this straight, but I, I think a lot of people don't really understand the incredible social mobility of the Roman world mm-hmm. and the exciting way that, you know, just to go straight in with it, you know, this idea of being born a slave was not a life sentence all the time in the Roman world. You know, there was the potential, when you look at the sources, when you look at the epigraphic record, there was the potential for people to be freed, to become freed men and women, to earn freedom, which often, you know, you do see in, in the arts and things like that. But, mm-hmm. you know, that, that really happened. And the, you know, increasingly the blemish of, of slavery was actually not that much of a limitation on your life. There's when you go to any provincial town, you know, certainly Herculaneum and Pompeii, you will see huge amounts of free people who then became the most, literally the most powerful people in the town. Some of the richest people in the Roman world often, um, later, you know, the sons of, of slaves are going to become emperors. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously a lot of people lived horrific lives of slavery but there was the chance that you know we have a lot of slavery and a lot of eras that was a life sentence and you could Mm -hmm. never come back from that but there was this incredible exciting social mobility in the ancient world that i think you know people should look into more Mm -hmm. and you know it's a huge topic of course um but they're very serious one fun one for your listeners that i think they might be uh you could you could put straight in two minutes which i always really niggles me when I see it. Uh, we all love Spartacus. We all love Gladiator. We've all seen these fantastic battles in the arena. We've all seen the blood. We've all seen the excitement. Uh, again, Gladiator is one of the main reasons I'm sat here today. So, you know, no problems with that at all. But there's this uh, prevailing preconception that these were, you know, all out no holes barred, you know, battle mm-hmm. royales that always ended in the most bloody deaths imaginable and uh, decapitations and, you know, the crowd, the the great unwashed, you know, are cheering and, <laughs> and cursing and um, kind of uh, banishing people to death with, you know, thumbs up and thumbs down. Right. And uh, I think it's, there's a lot of misconceptions, uh, you know, swirling amongst all of that. One thing that I could you know, put to bed really quickly is that there is another person missing from these depictions uh, that you so often see in the film and media. And I can, I can probably, I can imagine why they're missing. And that is the referee. Mm-hmm. There was, there was, as you'll know, a referee in, a, certainly if it was an official bout, you know, in Rome, 
it would be tightly refereed, sometimes even by a team of referees. Mm -hmm. And the head referee was the summer Rudis, named after his his cane, which he could right. you know intervene with, you know, just like a centurion and give a, give a few lashings if someone um, was you know breaking some of the rules. And we, we don't know what the rule book was as such, but there was it seemingly you know a pretty uh, uh, tight rule book for gladiator bouts. And you know you got to you got to think more these things more about. Um, uh, kind of displays of of fighting excellence. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, these are display matches a lot of the time. Um, gladiators, you know, they are the prize-winning racehorses of the ancient world. They have a huge amount of investment in them mm -hmm. by gladiator trainers and lanistas and teams of gladiator schools. Um, you know, there's a lot of a bit of research recently on this. A lot gone into their diets, obviously. You know, their accommodation. Mm -hmm. um, of course, overriding all that, these are slaves, which is one of the just wonderful dichotomies of the ancient world. You know, these these guys are adored, uh, but they're despised as, you know, mm -hmm. kind of subhuman in some way as well. But there's a lot of exciting contrast to our modern our modern world. You know, you could probably make that comparison to a, a heavyweight championship bout or, a, you know, a Very UFC so. cage match uh, where... You know, a lot of these guys are from working class backgrounds. They just happen to have this incredible, obviously they've trained, worked hard, but they've got this incredible fighting prowess, which people adore and can't help being swept up in. Um, but Gladiator Bouts probably had more rules than that. And if, mm -hmm. you know, if any of your listeners don't believe me, there's fantastic mosaics that I've seen uh, in Verona where... Um, uh, a villa owner actually has this kind of mosaic comic strip of a gladiator fight and getting right in the middle of there is the tunic wearing uh, mm. referee and he is breaking them up and the gladiators are complaining and there's even i believe a, a tombstone where from beyond the grave a gladiator says i'm i'm lying here because of a referee's bad decision you know he <laughs> kind of let the other guy do me in right and you know so you can imagine the crowd kind of booing and cheering decisions and, and things like that um but the referee would be breaking them up and uh you know there would be illegal moves and um mm -hmm. i think there's accounts where um armor or weaponry is is damaged and you know the bout is stopped so everything things to be changed so you mm -hmm. know the let, let's imagine a little bit more of that formality, that display to, uh, to gladiator bouts. You know, these were meant to thrill. Now, did gladiators die horribly? Absolutely. You know, were there horrendous deaths in the Colosseum? Of course they were. But um, a lot of gladiators, you know, we now think, you know, had quite a lot of, of bouts that they survived, maybe even um, quite long careers. A lot of them earned their freedom or a good number would, you know, would earn their freedom potentially. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this is all echoed in the the chariot racing circus as well, of course. But certainly, I think, uh, well, that that actually is criminally underpresented in mm -hmm. in the arts and film. I think, you know, apart from Ben Hur, there's not really right, many right. exciting explorations of that. But uh, you know, let's um, yeah, let's think more about the gladiators as these these yeah these contrasting heroes of, of the ancient world that uh, they you know they. They've given up their freedom. A lot of them have, um, you know, been born as slaves or captured. But uh, there, there's, there's a level of formality to their to their bouts that I think is com completely missing from the very very fun depictions in in Spartacus mm -hmm. and uh, and whatnot. But uh, yeah, the referee, he was there. Oh, that, that's an excellent point. You know, comparing them, I think, to to prize fights is a nice analogy, mm. um, where you have you know two you know highly trained heavyweights slugging it out, both in the parameters yep. of this very carefully defined um, you know game, essentially. Yeah. And um, I, I know I've read you, you mentioned these tombstones that mention you know kind of the, the rules of the game. You know where you, the, he was. You know this guy was applauded for fighting fair, um, or you know someone you know even there there's this reluctance to kill their opponents you, know, they, 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 mm. you, you kind of you know fight you know but uh you only kill someone yeah. if they're breaking the rules there's sort of this you know this uh sure you know and just to give a style. contrast in point of view mm -hmm. i mean i said that you know death obviously took place sometimes of course it oh, of did course, yeah. and mm -hmm. uh you know i kind of maybe get the idea that uh you know if a gladiator had, had a really bad run or if you know mm -hmm. again like a racehorse he was aging and past his prime he right. probably you know was was sweating a little bit at what his uh 
of what the decision might be. And dare I say it, you know, maybe the um, this is this is a baseless accusation for me. It might be libelous, <laughs> but uh, maybe there was a little bit of like the modern uh, WWE there, where some yes. uh, mm-hmm. some decisions were maybe already decided before they walked mm-hmm. out onto the sand that day. Uh, but <laughs> you know, I'm not throwing any accusations in any direction there. But um, you, you know, there's there are of course powerful sources where uh, mm-hmm. there's an elitist aspect where people like. Um, I think Seneca and Cicero maybe are dragged to the games in, in different mm-hmm. sources. And, you know, right. they kind of, they put on this show of, oh, you know, I was dragged along by my friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe Catullus as well. And, you know, the, the, this idea of them being completely swept up once they saw the blood, once they saw, mm-hmm. maybe a lot of injuries were for show, you know, this idea. But once they saw the blood, you know, they were, they couldn't pull their eyes from it. Right. And, um you know, Cicero, I think, talks about the stoicism of the gladiators in that were, you know, a lot of the, the deaths would be an execution style death for a gladiator that had not performed very well, or maybe, like I said, was past his prime. And, you know, I, yeah, I think it's Cicero who laments on the, or who writes quite powerfully about his respect for the gladiators who never pull their neck away from, from the mm-hmm. sword that they know is coming, you know, never try and get away once they know the game is up. Uh, so you get this. And actually, uh, I saw a relief in uh, Duras in Albania. Mm-hmm. Um, if any of my you know followers want to look that up, there's a gladiator who's being executed and he's got his you know, he's on his knees with his head down mm-hmm. and quite cinematically, just like you'd see in the movies, a gladiator is behind him, putting the, the mm-hmm. sword down through his shoulder blades. Um, you know, obviously horrific, these things, it, you know, it, it often was a bloodbath, but, you know, probably more with animals, which is again, mm-hmm. something I can never, ever get behind in the ancient world. You know, I don't just think the Romans are amazing. Uh, the blood, <laughs> the bloodshed of animals was just horrific in the, in the arenas. And, um, prisoners of course which mm-hmm. would be kind of like your halftime show at the super bowl <laughs> right. for the romans you know it was executions of of criminals and um again it's just the past is another country like you said yeah you know, it is it's hard to wrap your head around kind of again these these echoes that seem so familiar whether it's wwe or prize fighting yeah and these things that are just like hey we just killed a thousand prisoners in this spectacle you know and you know yeah. enjoy your roasted chickpeas um <laughs> and, and so, so yeah it is it, it's a fascinating study in contrasts and you know odd echoes yeah and, and so i guess and, and on that note you know thinking about the the fascination the enduring fascination of the roman world for for us you know, for, for both of us having all of these these followers, you know, obviously there's a widespread fascination with the Roman world that might be begun in school, begun in various sorts of mass media, but has spread throughout our culture um, in all sorts of ways. And, and so I, I guess, you know, to ask, you know, a, a big and in some ways unanswerable question, you know, uh, why in your opinion, um, do the Romans still matter in, in this day and age? You know, what is it um, that breeds this fascination? You know, if you can articulate that. <laughs> I think the Romans still matter for a number of reasons. You know, firstly, like I've already kind of evoked the, this idea that they insert themselves into our lives, whether they like it or like whether we like it or not, you know, in the most surprising ways at the most surprising times. They're a force that's always present in our lives, you know, almost wherever you live, um, mm-hmm. certainly in the Western world. Uh, yeah, again, whether you pull back the curtain and see them there or not, you know, they're kind of there watching us and judging us at all times, you know, whether it's in our language and mm-hmm. etymologies and idioms and, uh, or our laws, uh, of course, that we're, you know, that we're kind of privy to and our customs. So many of these things go back to the Roman world. And once you start to kind of dig, you, you uncover all these these things that you know can be directly traced back to them. Really, um, I love this idea of the Roman world as this kind of parallel Hogwarts style, you know, mm-hmm. C.S. Lewis style parallel world that is always there. And sometimes you can physically pull back that curtain and see them there. And uh, you know, from my point of view, uh, I live in, in in Wiltshire. My nearest town is Cirencester, which was a huge, you know, tribal capital of the Romans, and. Um, you know, there, if you've got a back garden and you dig a hole in that back garden, you are finding Corinium, the ancient city, you know, and you're going to have to call an archaeologist because the Romans are there, mm-hmm. whether you like it or not. And I, I'm always blown away continuously by the brazenness and the audacity of the Romans to continue to even not metaphorically, but physically shape our world 2000 years later. Um, the town's the roads that I drive often they're directly on top of Roman roads. Mm-hmm. Um, you know the 
the places I visit, obviously, but you know the the way their uh, their cities evolved and morphed and often just became that the places we live today, and uh, you know you know aqueduct bridges that will just soar over a valley that you know they wouldn't let stop them. They they still have this physical legacy in a world millennia, um, you know, apart from from when they existed, which I think is 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 pretty unique you know of course there's other mm-hmm. huge empires but the the expanse of the roman world which when you travel a little bit you start to appreciate mm-hmm. you know i've been very lucky to go pretty far east and um, pretty far north pretty far south you know i've been to the very lucky to visit the deserts of libya and mm-hmm. stroll the streets of leptis magna and you know I, a few years back i walked the full length of hadrian's wall in a few days mm-hmm. and you know i had a lot of time to think about these these centurions posted on the on the distant you know wilds of uh, the north of Britannia, and you just think the sheer might of Rome. You know, when you drive in the desert for hours on end, and then you just suddenly see this amphitheater mm-hmm. sticking up, you know, in in El Gem, just like the Colosseum after hours of nothingness, and you just think the sheer audacity of 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 that people to to put their mark on the world. To that extent, I think, you know, has to be respected, whether you hate some of the stuff the Romans achieved mm-hmm. as well, you can't help but respect them. And um, following on from that, you know, this idea of uh, they they inspire us, of course, with the physical legacy they've left behind. But I see the Romans as kind of humanity untethered in a way that we're very, very tethered down today. And a lot of mm-hmm. us, you know, manage our behavior very carefully, carefully, and we live within a a Judeo-Christian framework of morals, you know, even when we count ourselves as as not religious ourselves, you know, um, Mm -hmm. I'd recommend people maybe read uh, Tom Holland's latest work on that in Dominion, a fantastic piece of work, you know, and the Romans are just, just a fabulous example of kind of humans just off the leash, you know, like I said, living Mm -hmm. on the edge, and you kind of see what we're capable of, goods and bads, you know, the, the wonderful, the heinous, you see everything really. You see the whole tapestry of, of human achievement in mm-hmm. you know, the thousand years really uh, of the Roman world. And I've always just found that just so exciting. You see the full spectrum and it just, just like someone like uh, in the opening of his histories, you know, Livy writes about looking back to his ancient world mm-hmm. and how it was just this wonderful escape for him. And, um, he says that you know his ancient history gave him uh, examples and warnings and models to go by and you know base things to avoid that he saw people doing and you see that in the roman world you know i think for all the things we've talked about you see these incredible mm-hmm. incredible examples of what we can achieve you know it's like looking back to the moon landings you think wow you know we are capable mm-hmm. of some incredible things as a you know, wider humanity, like all in it together. Mm-hmm. Um, but God, look at the things we're also capable of. Look at the things that might be innate to us. And uh, mm-hmm. again, like I've already said, I'm very wary of this kind of moral superiority thinking, oh God, we'd, we'd never do that today. Um, because, you know, if you go to a UFC cage match or if you go to a <laughs> bullfight, you know, you're going to be pretty much going, but, you know, those same primal urges that the Romans mm-hmm. were kind of indulging are going to come out. And increasingly, we take issue with a lot of those. And, you know, that's a, that's, that's a fantastic thing. But um, I just think you see the full spectrum of, of human experience. So it's kind of like why, you know, I, I, I my, my previous life, I was a literature teacher. And um, I, it's akin to the works of Shakespeare for me, really. Like mm-hmm. I can sit down with Hamlet and think, OK, this, this you know, three, four hour play, pretty much covered what the human experience is you know he's a teenage male Mm -hmm. uh in northern europe but that doesn't matter he's pretty much covered the ins and outs of what it's like to be a human being (laughs) and i you know i i i do see that when i when i go in in, into Mm -hmm. the roman world as well you know i just see a world where pretty much everything that could happen is going you know is has happened somewhere and the sources are so exciting Mm -hmm. um and yeah, just just finally, you know that that chance they offer us to reflect on our own achievements. Um, I think the, the the greatest thing I think for me is this they're this kind of like a touchstone that makes you reflect and feel a little bit more humble. Because when you, which I would recommend to any followers, if you can walk the streets of a Roman town 
that's mm-hmm. quiet, you know, Pompeii, fantastic. But, uh, you know, if you can get to a provincial Roman town and you can walk the streets of a forum and you can see the tumble down buildings. And again, just to evoke, a, a, you know, one example, you know, I remember standing in the forum of, of Leptis Magna in, in North mm-hmm. Africa or Sabratha in Libya. And the, pre, the forum is absolutely gigantic. I don't know how many football fields it is, but you know, the walls have tumbled down a little bit. There's been a lot of earthquakes. The sand dunes have kind of encroached, Mm -hmm. but pretty much it's as it was. And I remember standing on the podium of the the Capitol Temple there. And uh, my father was just kind of, you know, milling around some of the broken, you know, tumbled mountains of marble. And there was, you know, Medusa heads just Mm -hmm. tumbled and upended, kind of looking at me as as I wandered across this kind of shattered city. And, you know, I was, I was in my, I was, I was younger, younger at the time. And I just remember it had a profound impact on me in the sense of humility, because you could almost hear the ghosts of the people, you know, in those mm-hmm. streets. And there was, you know, like I said, gaming boards kind of etched in where you can imagine a group of old, old guys or young guys having a little game on the steps of the temple there. And it was like mm-hmm. the people had just kind of cleared off uh, yesterday. And you just think, They must have thought this could never end, you know, this when our civilizations are so seemingly strong and unstoppable Mm -hmm. uh, and we're in such decadent times and such easy times, you know, dare I draw a parallel to today, (laughs) it's very easy to, I think, get, you know, complacent and they probably thought it would never end, but it did end. And when you walk around a city that is covered in earth and Mm -hmm has tumbled down and and no one's left (laughs) you think wow okay these are the you know these are the ups and downs that haunt you know the the human experience really and we've got to be aware of them at all times Mm -hmm. and i think they probably offer us you know the biggest example of just a wondrous empire with all its incredible achievements that is now just uh you know Mm -hmm. like shelley says you know that the the barren lands stretch Mm -hmm. far away so i i I've kind of that that just stuck with me, and every time I visit a Roman site now, I try to get it get to a quiet corner of it mm-hmm. and just sit and just think, you know, what were the priorities of the people that sat in this space? So I remember being uh, in Perge in in Turkey, mm-hmm. oh, and yes. uh, you know, my group were going off in one direction, and I thought, well, I'm going to go. There's something over here I wanted to see, and I, uh, you know, the scene opened up, and I was in the the racetrack, oh yes, the circus, and I was the only one there. And I remember taking a seat on the stands. They were all pretty much intact. And uh, you could just hear, you know, the wind. And I was just thinking of the scenes that, that must have, you know, the celebrations, the mm-hmm. the tears, the fights that must have been on that space and uh, in that space. And, mm-hmm. you know, you, you, feel, you feel a oneness, but you also feel this incredible distance from the people of that world. But uh, they were people just like us. And again, they probably thought their world was invincible, but mm-hmm. they never are. So... They're just a, good, a great reminder of that, I think. Well, absolutely. I definitely had a few of those uh, Ozymandias moments myself in, in Roman sites. I remember yeah. once, um, also in Turkey, which of course I've always I spent a lot of time there when I was doing my research, and there's so <laughs> many sites that, for that are just, you know, never never excavated. You could be, you're there alone, and you're in the middle of, a, you know, a howling wilderness. And um, in particular, I was up at uh, Termesis, not not far from Antalya, up in the mountains there. <sighs> Love to visit there. And uh, oh, it was a wonderful site. And uh, so the, the main street there was colonnaded and lined, as they often were, by these, you know, uh, life-size statues of dignitaries. Um, and they were all bronze, so they've all vanished. But all the bases are still there, hundreds of them. And an earthquake has tumbled the whole street. So you have this, this uh, great jumble of columns and bases and blocks. And, uh, you know, all overgrown with trees now. And so I was yeah. kind of picking my way through that. Um, and, you know, I remember kind of sitting down at one point, I'm on this, this pile of blocks and uh, reading one of the inscriptions that was kind of half exposed, you know, in Greek. And it was, you know, just very conventional, you know, X and Y, city councilor, sponsored the games, mm-hmm. you know, lover of his city. And, you know, there, there's kind of this feeling of, right, kind of placid, you know, civic pride, you know, a little self-satisfied perhaps. And then... The earthquake came and the people left yeah. and there it's been for 17 centuries. Um, and yeah, there, there is that, that, that powerful, right, that human echo then overlaid mm. by this sense of overpowering loss. And, uh, and the idea also, you, you mentioned kind of the idea that the Roman idea of history, kind of history is example, as example, history is examples of good and bad, um, of people, of, of, you know, of places, of civilizations. You know, it's an old idea of history, but still I think a very powerful and effective one that, you know, really it's the most 
human, a natural way to see history as mm. lives lived. You know, and, and of course, you know, we as modern historians tend to look more at structures of societies, whatever else. And that's very important and valuable. Sure. But we, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that it was people living their lives, you know, for better or for worse. And that uh, whether we have, you know, a Plutarch documenting them or just you know, we find those little glimpses and in inscriptions or other texts, papyri, you name it. Um, it is that, that, that powerful evocation. And, uh, and even like you said, how the Romans are always there and more powerfully for you, of course, being by Siren Sester, you know, for me here in the new world, there's not a whole <laughs> lot of Roman stuff, um, besides what we've imported, but we have imported, um, kind of the ghost of Rome, you know, mentally, mm. you know, we've, we've, re we've recreated it. We have cities called Rome or Troy or Sparta, of course. you know, and of course every, you know, 19th century, 19th century bank has, you know, the colonnade out front, you know, that this kind of virtual Rome that lives both within <laughs> us, you know, from education and, you know, in our cities. And, you know, we've, we've environed ourselves in Rome, even here, you know, 5,000 miles from any place the Romans ever touched. Um, Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a great way of putting it. And, you know, as you know, the founders mm -hmm. made explicit efforts to, to, like you said, transport the ideals and even the, you know, general structures of, of, of the Republic and, and things like that across the Atlantic and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, even transport physical aspects of that world. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I mentioned recently this idea of uh, the founders as, as collectors of the ancient world and, you mm -hmm. know, Jefferson was really into ancient coins and, uh, you know, really looking at the examples left by these leaders uh, in the ancient world and, and really trying to you know, build a, um, a republic from scratch with, with the ancient world, certainly the Roman world, very much in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, these echoes are everywhere. And all you have to do is kind yeah. of, you know, look for them and then you always find them waiting. Um, yeah. well, well, anyway, um, Gareth, this has been wonderful. Uh, thanks so much um, for taking the time to join us here. Um, My pleasure. For, Oh, well, well, yes, I very much likewise. Um, for anyone who's not encountered it before, um, Optima Principi on Twitter, uh, check it out. It's great stuff. Um, if you haven't seen the Tolan Stone uh, YouTube channel by some circumstance, check that out too. It's great too, I think, you know, but I'm biased, so whatever. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, Gareth, thanks again. And to everyone, uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>